Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. What you need to do is forget all about the ideas, pick different areas of your business that you want to innovate on, different technologies that you want to experiment with, and then spend all your time selecting the right people. Because at the end of the day, the idea doesn't matter. It's the people. You need these real innovators, these real people who can execute on these ideas, run out, run these experiments, gather data, figure it all out, and then come up with something solid that you can bring to market. And if you do it that way, instead of idea first, people first, you are in a very good position to actually innovate. Whether you're a startup, whether you're a giant, uh, you know, global multinational corporation. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with trust-based sales expert Ari Gelper and with Ashley Nichols, the author of Tech to Save the World, then do go listen in. But listen to today's conversation first, of course. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Steve Hoffman, or Captain Hoff, as he's called in Silicon Valley, the captain and CEO of Founders Space one of the world's leading startup accelerators. He's also a venture investor, serial entrepreneur, and author of several award-winning books. These include Make Elephants Fly and Surviving a Startup. Steve launched Founders Space with the mission to educate and accelerate entrepreneurs. Steve has trained hundreds of startup founders and corporate executives in the art of innovation and provided consulting to many of the world's largest corporations, including Qualcomm, Huawei, Bosch, Intel, Disney, Warner Brothers, NBC, Gulf Oil, Siemens and Viacom. In our conversation today, Steve talked to me about what innovators should do first before they come up with any ideas. We talked about the essential ingredients that innovation teams must possess. And we talked about celebrating failure in a way that we learn from that. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Steve Hoffman. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from Virginia in the USA, normally based in San Francisco, but traveling the country at the moment. Steve Hoffman, he's the chairman and CEO of Founders Space, and he's also author of several award-winning books, including Make Elephants Fly, an interesting title, which talks about the process of radical innovation. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Steve. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. It is wonderful to be here. Now, Founders Space has become one of the top startup accelerators in the world, and you've worked with hundreds of startup founders there to train them and and really get them in the right headspace. And also, you've worked with corporate executives on the art of innovation. So I'm really looking forward to exploring all those things, particularly around innovation with you today and uh, digging into your experience. Before we do that, what is the impact you're having in the world today? I am trying to have as big an impact as possible, like we all are in this business. I run Founderspace, and Founderspace is a global startup incubator and accelerator. So we started in Silicon Valley. 
but we expanded globally. We have partners in 22 countries. We have our own incubators across China in most of the major cities. And I travel a lot, but COVID kind of kept me <laughs> in a closet for the past year. But I'm back on the road with my double vaccines ready to go. And um, what I do is I tend to do three things. So one, we at Founderspace, we are always looking for cutting edge startups. So we bring them into our incubator. We help them, uh, train them, actually help them go to market and especially raise capital. I am also an investor so that when we find a great startup, you know, I can put some of my own money into that startup. The next thing I do a lot of is I work with large corporations, you know, Fortune 500 companies, some of the biggest companies in the world like Bosch, Qualcomm, Huawei, and I help them in a number of areas. So I help them with innovation. I help them with new product ideas. I help them access technology and startups that are developing it. And I, and I've even helped them run their own and develop their own incubators and accelerators. And lastly, just so you know, you know, I am, I am an author. Uh, Make Elephants Fly is my innovation book, but I just launched a book on startups called Surviving a Startup, which gives entrepreneurs like everything they need to know to really grow their companies and make those companies so that they can survive even in really tough times. Wonderful. Well, you're a really busy man and uh, traveling all around the world. I wonder how you fit all that in. Anyway, um, what I'm curious about, you're also known in Silicon Valley as Captain Hoff. So where did that nickname come about? Captain Hoff actually was my gamer handle. Oh, uh, right. So, you know, gamers <laughs> out there, they have a handle. I actually started my career as an entrepreneur designing and developing games. So mm -hmm. very early on, I was developing games uh, for computers, then online games, then mobile games. So I, I did a lot of that early in my career. Really, I was basically uh, training myself uh, in innovation through designing oh, probably close to a hundred different products, some of them very big name products, others of them uh, much smaller. But I also designed products for companies like Intel, AdAge, you know, interactive products that weren't just games, but were also applications that they would use all the way back to the early days of the internet and even before that. Wow. Uh, been in the tech space for a long time then. I have my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really interested in digging into one particular topic that's close to my heart with you. And we, we touched on this before we started recording. So as my regular listeners know, I'm a keen photographer and in my early career, I worked for ACFA in the time when digital photography started coming onto the consumer space. And I saw the reaction of the big film companies that essentially said, we just need to make better film because this is never going to be any good, this digital thing. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to explore with you, what is it, why is it that the big companies kind of sit back on their core business and react in that sort of manner to disruptive technology that comes along? And, and there's a follow on question from that, but let, let's deal with that one first. Big companies are really entirely structured around making revenue off their current models. So whatever their model is, uh, they have figured that out and they have become big companies precisely because they are very good at that. They are experts at that. In that time, uh, they're sitting on top of, you know, a money making machine. Hmm. It's very hard to look at this money making machine and say, well, this won't be around forever. So we're going to have to totally change everything we do. I mean, honestly, most, uh, companies don't want to face that in the first place. And in the second place, they don't, they aren't sure what to do. And they're usually the last ones to see how big the change is because they are partially stuck in denial mode. They are used to being king of the hill. They don't expect to be you know, dethroned anytime soon. So um, it's very hard for the executives on top of those machines to actually uh, look forward to the day when, when what they're doing right now doesn't work at all. But for an entrepreneur, 
coming into the space. They've got nothing to lose. Like literally, they, you know, if they can cannibalize that business, they will. The got people who, who are making all the money, the last thing they want is to cannibalize their own business. It just goes against everything mm. that they've been trained to do. They, they've been trained to maximize their process. They have become big by making it so efficient. And the last thing they want to do is introduce something else that is going to maybe be cheaper, maybe, you know, uh, be totally, uh, change the whole system so that they're no longer the dominant force or might not be. However, for a startup, this is exactly what they want to do. And they don't care if this is a multi-billion dollar business and, and the big fish are taking, taking it all. They don't care if they only get a small slice at the beginning, you know, a million dollars, a hundred million dollars of this big business. They will lower the price, undercut the price, do anything they can to disrupt it because everything they do uh, at the end of the day will come back to them. And we know whenever you're pioneering a new platform, a new way of doing business, if you become the dominant market force, all of a sudden everybody else becomes irrelevant. Then you could raise prices. Yeah. And also technology makes things so much more efficient that you can undercut existing players simply by using technology to deliver goods and services at a, a lower cost, to deliver them more efficiently, and most importantly, to add more features than they could offer. Mm, yeah, you, you mentioned something there that was going to be my kind of second corollary to to the question, and, and it's how do you, um, if if a company decides to innovate and they've got this money-making machine that is kind of underpinning their business and, and it's working really well, it has been for, for many years and that's how they've gotten big, how do you balance that with, okay, there's there's an innovation that potentially could actually disrupt that completely. And in the example of the photography, it was Sony, the company that first commercialized a, a digital camera and basically started the revolution, even though um, companies like, well, Kodak actually had the first patents on uh, digital photography or Polaroid even before that had some, um, and yet they ignored it because they were so vested in film. Uh, so it wasn't a, a startup that really triggered the revolution. It was another big corporation that was expanding their reach outside of, you know, their um, electronic entertainment as it was at the time to digital. So how do you, how does a company that's established balance that uh, disruptive innovation with the core business? When you are looking out at the future, as an executive at a big company, you have to be prepared to totally cannibalize and disrupt your business. Like you cannot worry about killing off your business. You cannot worry literally about killing the goose that laid the golden egg. So because what you have to figure, you have to have the right mindset. So you have to understand that this goose that is laying these golden eggs, if you don't kill it and cook it and eat it, somebody else will. Yeah. <laughs> like somebody else is going to do it. So it, that goose is days are numbered, right? It is, it's going to be served up on somebody's plate. It might as well be your plate. So the problem is that a lot of the people in your organization, uh, they might not have this mindset, even if perhaps you do in the organization or as a consultant to it, you have this. They often don't. So one way to do it is what IBM did. So IBM, Trans has transformed itself a number of times. They were a big mainframe company, you know, and then the PCs started to come out and most of the mainframe companies like Digital Equipment Corp and all these other ones, they no longer exist yeah. because they didn't make that transition. But IBM literally set up a separate group, gave them complete autonomy, gave them the ability to just go after the PC market, you know, and compete with their main business. And what they saw was that their main business was, you know, dying, but elite, but their PC business was growing like crazy. So you almost um, have to take a fresh talent or talent that is in your company that is really untapped, put them into this new organization, but you cannot put it under the existing one mm. because the existing one is going to be focused on what they do best. That is what they do. They they have, they, they know how to make money that way. And you have to have this other one literally compete with them as a startup. Mm. That, that, that solution does work. Yeah. So essentially you're setting up a, almost a different company, a little startup team. Yes. And 
Uh, the example of Sony is also important. Like Sony uh, ended up, uh, you know, launching digital cameras, even though Kodak had patents and other people had patents, Polaroid, uh, ahead of them and actually taking their market, you know, starting the whole trend. Now, Sony isn't a startup, but they could do this because they weren't cannibalizing their business. Mm. They weren't one of the big camera yeah, makers. Yeah. So they, they had, again, they had nothing to lose, right, by doing this. And they were really good at making gadgets. They had been doing that. You know, they had made the Walkman and all these things. And that was that was their business, electronics. So for them, it was a natural thing to do. For these other camera companies and film companies, it was really not natural at all. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, I remember one of the discussion points at the time was around um, silver being in tight supply. And, and how can we um, how can we be less dependent on silver for our films you know and, and in hindsight that was the wrong question to ask it was how can we be less dependent on film for for doing <laughs> what we really do which is giving people the ability to capture memories rather than take pictures absolutely so in your experience what are what are some of the um things that successful startups so let's use the term startup as you know a new business a new company or even in like your example from ibn a new division that's completely autonomous that has the freedom to kind of potentially disrupt the core business so what are the things that successful startups do to innovate i work with hundreds of startups every year all over the world and you know, I coach them, I mentor them, I invest in them, I want them to succeed. And I have observed what the really good startups do uh, that and that the other ones don't. And this is true also for large corporations. It's actually the same thing. <laughs> so I work, you know, I work with some of these big companies and I won't name them. But one of the biggest mistakes that uh, that entrepreneurs make and also big companies make, they both make the same mistake. They start with the idea. They start saying, let's, for a big company, a big corporation, and I'm sure you know ones who have done this, they say, let's have a contest. Let's have all our, you know, employees submit their best ideas. And then we will have our managers pick the very best ones and we will fund those as our innovation projects. With startups, they kind of obsess startup founders over the idea. What's the perfect idea? What's the perfect idea? Well, these methods are flawed. Because whatever idea you have in your head is literally just an idea in your head. It doesn't matter until you take that idea out of your head and put it into the real world and start to see if it works. If you become too focused on the idea, what it does is it ends up locking you in. Now, let me give you an example of this. So for, uh, I worked for a big company, which I won't name, and I was working with one of the teams and they had run a contest. This team, this per, you know, project manager had won and they got money from the company to develop the idea into a new business. Well, the first thing I do when I come into this company, I'm working with their team, their internal innovation team, the intrapreneurs. And I'm like, do you, do you, can you show me that this idea actually works in the real world? Is there any evidence you can give me that this works? And they didn't have them. <laughs> So I said, well, your first job is to go out and get that evidence. You have to engage with your customers and figure out, do your customers really need this? I mean, I know it's a cool idea. It was a smart parking idea. And and I see why you like it. But let's find out if these parking garages are going to adopt this technology. Because if they don't have the budget, if they don't care, you don't have a business. So they literally... uh They they're, were tasked with this. They went out. They talked to all the parking garages everywhere, you know. And they found out that the technology was really cool. The company, they could make this and it would really be great in these garages for guiding people to the parking places and making it more efficient. But none of the people running these garages had any interest yeah. in spending money or time on it. They just let people park themselves. We don't care if we know what every, if every space is full. Like we, we just don't need this right now. We're not going to do it. So they get this feedback. And I go, okay, there's your answer. They don't want it. Like, you're not going to sell this to them. They don't really care. And uh, they they said, yeah, that's true. And I go, okay, we what we need to do to save money is cancel this right away and go and come up with a new idea. You have a great team. You guys are really motivated. Let's come up with something else. 
they turned to me and they said, we can't do that. I was, why? <laughs> why can't you do that? Well, my boss likes this idea. <laughs> well, you got to tell your boss it's a bad idea. Like, you've got to go. I can't do that. But my boss, you know, their boss <laughs> likes the idea. Everybody likes the idea. They've approved this. They want us to do this. It was, and there you go. That's why it's a bad idea to start with the idea. You get locked into these ideas. In corporations, it's even worse than a startup. Hmm. So in a startup, a lot of times a startup founder will fall in love with their idea. And when you fall in love, I always like to say love is blind. <laughs> like, you know, you could fall in love with somebody and you could think like you're infatuated. They're the best person in the world for you. And all your friends and your family could tell you this isn't a good match, but you won't listen. Well, the same thing is true when you love your product idea. Like you could just like put on the blinders. You don't want to hear it. You're just going to go and do it because you think it's great. Well, it doesn't matter how much you love your idea. The customer has to love your idea. That's how you build a business, not how passionate. I tell entrepreneurs, you can be as passionate as you want about your ideas, but if the customer isn't passionate, you don't have anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, right point. Yeah. So, so when I consult for these big companies um, and startup founders alone, I'm always telling them, look, you know, go early, you, you know, don't love your idea. What I want you to do actually at the beginning is don't pick any idea. Pick an area that you're interested in innovating on. So this area could be, I want to take blockchain and I want to apply it to making the fishing industry more productive and, and, you know, tracking everything. So you could say that's an area, but you don't have to come up with a specific idea. You can say, I'm going to try a lot of different things in the fishing industry with these different technologies. And I'm going to see what really resonates, what really works with them. That is a much better approach because from the outset, whether you're a big corporation, whether you're a startup, you're already uh, open to new ideas and you understand that every idea doesn't isn't even worth your love unless it proves itself, mm. like unless the customer falls in love with it. So you're going to go out and what startup founders need to do and what innovators and big corporations need to do is they need to run lots of experiments. So when I work with big corporations, I tell them, don't run a contest. Don't pick the idea. Don't pick the person with the best idea. Like the people with the best ideas, sometimes it's random that they come up with a great idea. Sometimes the idea that you think is the best isn't the best because your managers are being the judges, your executives are choosing, and they already have their own biases in place. No, what you need to do is forget all about the ideas, pick different areas of your business that you want to innovate on, different technologies that you want to experiment with, and then spend all your time selecting the right people. Because at the end of the day, the idea doesn't matter. It's the people. You need these real innovators, these real people who can execute on these ideas, run out, run these experiments, gather data, figure it all out, and then come up with something solid that you can bring to market. And if you do it that way, instead of idea first, people first, you are in a very good position to actually innovate. Whether you're a startup, whether you're a giant, uh, you know, global multinational corporation. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And it's interesting that, um, I mean, the, the ego gets in the way, right? If we attach ourselves to an idea and, uh, and we kind of lose sight of that, as you said, love, love can be blind. Um, so this innovation team then, what, what are some of the key things there to leading a team like that that's essentially outside of the mainstream core business? And, and what are some of the key things to keep them motivated if, you know, if, for example, they're running a bunch of different experiments with ideas that, or with areas that they're looking into and all of the feedback for quite some time is not, nobody's really interested in that one. So first of all, when you have an innovation team, innovation teams need to be able to try lots of different things and you as their manager need to understand that they're going to fail at most of these. That's just the process of innovation. I mean, if you knew the answer in advance, you wouldn't have to have an innovation team. Yeah. You would just build it and be successful. So by definition, innovating is when you don't know what the answer is and you have to go out there and try to figure it out. Now, how do you motivate uh, teams to really excel at this? Well, the first step is always pick the right people. Pick people who are naturally curious. People who are naturally 
uh, defying the orthodoxy. People are always questioning everything, asking questions, wondering why doesn't this work? Why couldn't we do it differently? And very importantly, when it comes to technologists, pick people who love to play with technology. They love it. So they're out there always trying new things. You know, they're rewiring their home with the latest networks. They're downloading SDKs from the internet just to try them out, you know, with open source. They're doing all the stuff that isn't in their job description. You need to get people like this, natural innovators, and put them together. So if you bring these people together, magic will happen. And the types of teams that I really like are teams where you have one, one person, one or more people who are technologists, like just so enamored with technology that they're always trying new things. Another person on the team, at least one, has to be a designer. Because in today's world, design innovation is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, the consumer experience, even B2B products, the experience matters. People will always gravitate towards the, the product that gives them the best experience, not necessarily all the features mm -hmm. or even the best features. And then thirdly, you need somebody on the team who is a project lead, somebody who can give it a vision, who can sell that vision, who can get other parties on board. If you're a big corporation, you need, you, you know, you can never do it in a bubble. There's the marketing people and all these other different groups in the company and a lot of R and D people in the company and they all have their own fight them. You need somebody who can break down those doors, but who's also tactful enough and uh, strategic enough to make it a win-win for other parties in the company to actually get the resources they need to grow. So you need to bring these people together. Once, once you have that core innovation team, you need to give them permission to try whatever they want. You cannot micromanage them. You cannot, you know, the last thing you want to do is put them in handcuffs, right? Where they get, they, they literally can't do what they want to do. So you need to give them a, a degree of autonomy that, you know, when you have a more mature business, you don't want that autonomy. What you want is efficiency. So everybody's like, you're always trying to optimize around efficiency. When you're innovating, efficiency doesn't matter at all. In fact, efficiency is your enemy. <laughs> you do not want them to be efficient. You want them to make mistakes, try different things that don't work, you know, do all these things. And they have to know uh, that when they're trying these things, they can try them without a risk of damaging their reputation or career. Really important. So like Google does something that's really clever is that when somebody kills a project that they've been working on, that they may have spent millions of dollars on, that, that, you know, that they put a lot of resources into. When the project lead says, okay, we've had enough. This isn't working. Kill it. They reward that product lead. They reward the person who killed it because, because they, they know that it's really hard to kill a project, especially in a big company, like a project that isn't working. Nobody wants to take the rap for the failure. So they will keep try to keep it going in hopes, in the small hope that this will somehow yield some fruit or maybe that they've been promoted out of the group by that time or moved out of the group so they don't have to take the fall for it. Um, that's, that's how large organizations work. So you have to reverse that and say, look, you tried this totally, totally uh, didn't work. Step forward. We, you know, Google would even sometimes offer people a free paid vacation and they'd throw a party in celebration of killing off these products. And then after that, they would have those same people come up and share their learning, make them into kind of heroes. Why did you kill the project? How did you know it wasn't working? You know, what would have you done to kill the project even sooner? Like, how could have you known this sooner so that when we do our other projects, we can all learn from what you did? and make ourselves and what did you also what did you um as a as a, the project team learn that was actually beneficial that we could take away in the future things that we you know that may turn into other projects within our company hmm. so those elements are really important when leading and forming innovation teams hmm. that uh, there's there's a big thing there with the the example of google that you mentioned that is i think you know, we, we all have this tendency to kind of move on from mistakes quickly. You know, our egos hurt. We feel bad because we've done something wrong, um, made a mistake. And yet the changing the mindset to celebrate the mistake in a way that, hey, 
there's something we can learn from this. So let's celebrate. Well, don't celebrate the mistake. Celebrate the learnings from this mistake. Let's analyze it. What did we learn from that? There's a real gift, isn't there? So and and that comes back to your earlier point, running lots of experiments where we're prepared to celebrate the mistakes or the failures, if you like, whatever, you know, my business coach says no such thing as failure, it's all feedback. So if we celebrate that feedback, we're much more prepared to run lots of experiments. Exactly. So when you are innovating, it it there is a process in place. And this is something I write about in my book, Make Elephants Fly. So there's an innovation loop. And, you know, the metrics for... Uh, for quantifying and measuring the success of like a traditional business are not the same for an innovation team. So a traditional business, you're looking at P&L, you're looking at you know how much money they can make, how fast they're going. For an innovation team, what you're measuring actually are how fast they can navigate through the innovation loop. And the innovation loop is pretty simple. The innovation loop starts with, I have an idea, I want to find out if this idea works. I develop and design an experiment. I put that experiment into the real world as closely as I can with real customers. I gather data. I analyze that data. And then I make a decision. Do I run another experiment? You know, what did I learn from this experiment? It, does it kill my idea? Or uh, do I need to shift focus and uh, actually pivot a little to make this work? What do I learn? And then you run the innovation loop again. And then you do that innovation loop over and over and over. So when you're measuring an innovation team, it's all about how fast they can get through this loop and what's the quality of data that they are gathering. How good are the experiments that they design? And, and how smart are the decisions, the strategic decisions they are making based on this data? Those are the metrics by which you judge the progress and performance of these innovation teams. Mm. Yeah, I love it. It's um, it's running lots of experiments. It's like it appeals to my scientific brain <laughs> as a trained scientist. It is science. Yeah. It, it mm. is science. At the end of the day, this is what scientists do. You know, most scientists, they have a hypothesis, and their job isn't necessarily to prove that that hypothesis is true. They want to find out what's mm -hmm. real, right? Is it true or is it false? They want to learn how the real world works. When you are an innovator, it's the exact mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, gather lots of data and learn from the data and then run the next experiment based on what you've already learned. Yes. And, you know, scientists who are trying to discover DNA or, you know, uh, or trying to figure out, you know, nuclear physics or something like that. They are running lots of experiments and the faster and smarter they can run those experiments, the more they learn and the closer they get to the ultimate mm. answer. Love it. All right. Well, this is fascinating. I could go on talking innovation and uh, innovation mindset a lot more, but I'm aware of the time. So I think it's a good point to move on to the innovation round, which are, are my scripted five questions. And you've probably touched on answers to most of these already. So we'll just get a summary from you. Um, it's designed to help our audience who are primarily leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So hopefully you'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. So what do you think Great. the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? The most important thing you can do to be more innovative is expose yourself to more ideas, more information, and actually uh, gather as much knowledge of the world as you can, and not just within your discipline, because actually much of the innovation that goes on is interdisciplinary. Mm. It's the intersection of biology and computer science and sociology and psychology. This intersection is really important. So bringing other people into your organization who are from those backgrounds, learning from them, watching them, and most importantly, asking questions, always asking questions. Yeah, I love love all of that. The, um, the idea of cross-discipline is fabulous because I think one of the key things for people who are really innovative is that they can connect the dots between seemingly disparate things. Um, so um, That is what innovation <laughs> is. 
and Einstein said it very succinctly. He, you know, he said all of his uh, experiments that he ran, thought experiments, you know, he said that was combinatorial play. Mm. What he meant is taking different ideas from different places, putting them together in different combinations, and then seeing what happened, what comes out of it. Mm. Right. Okay. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? The best thing I ever did to develop new ideas is to put myself in new situations, often very uncomfortable <laughs> situations. So a lot of us feel comfortable in what we do every day, our routines. You know, we meet the same people, we do the same work, we, we have, we read the same type of books, but I challenge, I actually challenge myself and I still continue to do this constantly. Look, Steve, go out there and, and just put yourself in a position that you've never been in. So for example, you know, I want to innovate about uh, on startup incubators and I am running a startup incubator. What can I do? Well, at the end of every incubation program we run, every single one we run, you know, first of all, we get feedback from people, from the, from the people in our programs, from the mentors who work with our programs, from advisors that I have. And then, you know, I will go out into the real world and look at how other organizations that want to create ideas work so that I can observe them. You know, what are other incubators doing? What are nonprofits doing? What are people doing in universities to actually stimulate this creativity and new ideas? And then I never want any incubator program we want run to be exactly the same. I want every single one to be somewhat different. So we are always tweaking it. We are always changing. We, even if we think we've got it down, we are trying new things. And that, that commitment to trying new things based on us going out into the real world and exposing ourselves to new ideas is really at the heart of how I like to end. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And it, it's kind of running experiments, isn't it? Except here you've, you, it you're is. basing it on on an existing product, if you like, that, that you have, but you're tweaking it and just running an experiment. I wonder if it'll be better if I change this bit or if I add this or take this away. Yes, and I don't assume that I know. Mm. Like, I, you know, I may think one thing, but well, let's try it. Let's give it a yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? My favorite resource that I use every single day is audiobooks. So I am a huge mm. audiobook fan because also because I am dyslexic. So reading print for me has always been a challenge, and I'm a very slow reader. But on audiobooks, literally, I've trained my brain so I can go at double yeah. speed. So I can consume a huge amount of content in, in a very short amount of time. So I'm always out there uh, going uh, onto Audible, onto the library system, downloading books. And I will um, literally go through at least one, if not more, audiobooks every week. And I don't, uh, I like to challenge myself not to stick with books that I already know all like. So I always want to challenge myself to, to read those, some of those books that are, that I would never actually normally read. So books about pieces of history that I don't know about, books about sociology, books about neurology, books about, um, you name it, marketing. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, poetry books, books of, you know, great literature. I'm trying always to mix it up. If I get too narrow, then I know I'm really not push expanding myself, really not broadening my horizon. So audiobooks are my number one. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of huge fan of audio books and of course as a podcaster that might not be a surprise. Um and <laughs> I'm I'm usually uh running about three at a time. So I'll, I'll what I usually do is during the day I might be listening to something related to the work I'm doing that I want to learn about or or often um the authors that come on the show, I'll be reading, listening to their books. Um, and then in the evening, I might listen to something else that might be either purely entertainment or completely different for me. And I love um, uh, National Geographic is a great source and they've got some great stuff uh, in audio and video, of course. Um, but um, I'm, I've am i gotten most of my audio listening up to about two and a half times. So <laughs> Working to try and get it up. To oh, three pretty times. good! Wow, you're you're faster <laughs> than me. You're you you're you're going. That's really great. Yeah, 
I usually ma I max out at about two point two five. It depends on it depends on who's reading. Sometimes sometimes I have to slow it down. Yeah, me too. And it depends on what I'm doing. Yeah. So sometimes I will listen. Uh, actually, quite often I will listen to audiobooks as I exercise. Mm. So if I'm exercising or something, I might slow it down to one point seven five. If I'm just sitting and concentrating, I can crank it up to two point two five. Great. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track? The best way uh, to keep a project on track is to rely on your team to do it, not to do it yourself. So you need to constantly be going to your team and not telling them, we're behind schedule. What's going to, you know, or are we on track? Are we on track? Or what you need to do is ask them, say, how can we keep this project on track? What do we need to do to keep this project on track? So if, if it's your small team, you can do that with your team. If you're relying on third parties, other people outside your core team, which you often are, you know, you're dependent upon them. So you need to go to them, not once, not twice, but literally every week and say, and ask them questions. You know, is there, are there any things we can do to speed this up? Are there any roadblocks that you see ahead? You know, of course you can use, you know, the project planning and project management software. Great. But there's nothing like meeting people and talking to them face to face and actually getting them to their commitment, first of all, and second, their buy in. And as soon as somebody tells you, you ask them a question like, how do we make this faster? They have to think about that. Or how can we make sure we hit that deadline? They have to think about that. And then when they answer you and tell you, they are in essence committing to doing that and making it happen. So that it's a big psychological thing. You can have all the software out there in the world, but you know, that psychology of you going face to face or even on Zoom or a phone call and actually getting that verbal commitment um, on a continual basis and finding out from them what problems there are, what things, you know, if they say, well, actually, we're, you know, we're, we're dependent upon this group and I think they're going to delay it. And then you could say, well, what can we do so that make sure that they don't delay it? How can we, you know, and then you just you you learn a lot about the project and um, you're not just telling people what to do, but you're making them proactive and actually taking ownership and actually coming up with the solutions. Hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a brilliant example of of using language to um, basically program program people's commitment to it. So asking them, you know, what can we do to keep this on track? What can we do to remove the barriers? As you say, they have to think about it. And then when they give an answer, they basically are committing to that. So it's different to, you know, it's a completely different response to, are we on track? Which yeah. you know, might be a, they would no, say no, we're not yes or, yes. or no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they're off the hook when you have yeah. to come up with a solution for them. Well, can you try this? Can you try that? Yeah, yeah. But then you're telling them and they're saying, well, we'll try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which means no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. All right. Um, final question to the buzz round. What's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? The number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself is understand what your competitors are doing. Like if you're competing with somebody else is the reason you have to be different. If you're not competing with anybody, <laughs> you don't need to be different. You can be whoever you are <laughs> because you're just the only one people can come to for this. But most of us are competing with somebody for, for our business. And you need to understand what everybody else does, what, and not just what they do, but how they position themselves to the customer. Like, how, what does the customer think of them? What does a customer, why is the customer going to them? What, and most importantly, what value is the customer getting uh, from, from these other parties? Now, if you're going to differentiate yourself, it's, there's two parts to it. One is kind of a branding image part, like messaging. What the, what the customer actually thinks. And equally important to that is what you actually deliver. Are you able to deliver a core value, a value that your customer really, really needs, um, that none of, no other party is, is delivering? If you can do that and you can make that a part of your core messaging, and this is a really valuable piece, then you, you're suddenly differentiated. People know why they're coming to you. They're coming to you because you can give them this and nobody else can can do it as well as you can, and that is the answer. Mm, yeah, that's uh, that's really great, and and you've captured a couple of 
key points there very succinctly. So focused on the value that you deliver to the customer and differentiate yourself by delivering value that nobody else does and get that into your message. Great. Well, thanks, Steve. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you, about Founders Space and about your books and maybe even get in touch to say thanks for what you shared today? If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm pretty easy to find. So all you have to do is go to foundersspace.com. Just go there. There's a contact form. You can actually contact me if you put my name in the, in, in, in the email that you send to me. I will respond. So that's one way. I am also on all the social networks. So you can go to uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, you name it. You know, I am there and just search for Founders Space and you will find me. Great. And we'll put some links in the show notes so people can click through and find it really easily. Now, do you have some parting advice you'd like to leave our listener today? My parting advice uh, for everybody out there is that you should try to make your work as exciting as possible. Like if you are bored at work, it's your <laughs> fault. So I don't think, I don't think anybody's job has to be boring, right? You can always make it exciting. So, you know, if you're trapped in a company and you feel like you, you don't have, you, you know, you're not being given enough responsibility. Well, just take responsibility. <laughs> Go to your boss and start coming up with ideas. Could I try this? Can I try that? What if we did this? You know, take initiative. Uh, if you work for yourself like me, you know, and you're getting bored with what you're doing all the time. Well, you work for yourself. You can change it. <laughs> you don't have to do this. You can go try something new. I do it often and it's like a great experience and it keeps my life exciting. So that's my part of the mm, Wonderful. So, yeah. So you don't need to be stuck in a rut. Um, you just change, change things up. Yes. And challenge yourself. Always challenge, challenge. Always challenge. Yeah. Love it. All right. Finally, Steve, who else should I get on this show and why? Oh, so who else? Yeah. Should you get on the show? Well, I know a bunch of people that I can refer you to. So, uh, uh one of the uh, great person I just talked to recently is Tom Poland. I can hook you up. He's at Leadsology. So he's a really interesting guy. And I will, do, I will actually give you like five names. For Wonderful. People. You can get on the show. All right, we'll follow up with you on that and uh, get some introductions. That will be great. So thanks a lot for sharing your wisdom and insights with us so generously and so passionately as well today. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a fun conversation. There's a lot to dig into, and I really encourage people to check out your books and your website um, because there's lots of valuable information there for anyone that's really into in innovation and um, technology as well. So. Um, Thanks again. My pleasure. <laughs> You're a great host. You ask great questions. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I, and I will help you. So just uh, remind me, ping me, and I will uh, uh, set up those introductions as soon as I can. And actually, I have a question for you, a small favor to ask. Sure. Um, if you know um, any other popular podcasters uh, out there, you know, I'm put, I'm, my, my book is launching, yeah. so I'm in the mode of, of getting the word out right now. And you don't mind making an introduction? I would love it. Certainly. I'll do that. Thanks a lot, Great. Steve. Thank you, and have, have a good evening. I hope you enjoyed that engaging and really value-packed conversation with Steve and took something away from his episode. I love Steve's passion and his approach to innovation as a science. Start with a hypothesis and run many experiments to discover information that can either prove or disprove that hypothesis and then use the lessons to move ahead. I'd love to know what you took away from Steve's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Hoffman. That is S-T-E-V-E. H-O-F-F-M-A-N, all lowercase, all one word, in overbiz.co forward slash Steve Hoffman. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Steve, as well as links to the Founder Space website, to his books, his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. 
Now, if you got value from this episode, then please don't keep it to yourself. Share it with other people that it might help. And tag me in on those shares so that I can thank you with a special surprise gift. Steve suggested we have a conversation with Tom Poland of Leadsology on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Tom, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Steve Hoffman. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including the queen of the sales success mindset, Christine Schlonsky, and author of legendary Tommy Breedlove. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.